Hi, my name is Steffen and I'm going to present NFC-Gate, a smartphone-based NFC security research toolkit. First, let's have a look at near field communication in general. NFC is a technology present in everyday life. For example, you can use NFC with your smartphone to pay for groceries in a store. Public transport systems feature NFC-based tickets. And at home, you can install NFC-based door locks. In general, we can say that NFC is a technology between a reader named PCD that communicates with a tag called PIC. An NFC research toolkit must be able to interact with both parties, tags and readers. In order to interact with tags, the toolkit must read so-called static tag data, for example, the NFC identifier. In addition, the toolkit must have the ability to exchange application protocol data units with a tag. To interact with a reader, the toolkit must feature acting like a tag. To do this, it emulates static tag data. Furthermore, it has to respond to APDUs sent by a reader. In addition, a research toolkit should provide additional research features such as analyzing data and testing different attack scenarios easily. There are already existing attacks on NFC-based systems, for example, electric vehicle charging stations. Some of these stations use the NFC identifier as authentication mechanism. Dahlheimer used dedicated hardware-based NFC tools to fool charging stations with cloned NFC tags in 2070. The recoil attack presented by Sun et al. 2020 extends the near field communication range up to 50 cm using custom hardware. There are many NFC toolkits widely available that form two categories, software-based tools on Android and dedicated hardware. A problem with Android-based tools is that their protocol support is rather limited. However, Android smartphones are inconspicuous and require no additional hardware at a low price. Hardware-based tools offer a greater protocol support, but they are suspicious and require a host. In addition, they are rather expensive. Then there is NFC Gate, which combines the protocol support of dedicated hardware with the availability, usability, handling and price of Android-based tools. Let's have a look at NFC on Android. On Android, we have the reader mode, which reads static tech data and can send and receive arbitrary APDUs to and from connected tags. So this mode fulfills the NFC toolkit requirements of interacting with tags. Interacting with the reader side is supported by host card emulation on Android, which allows an Android device to emulate an NFC tag. However, it is limited since it does not allow controlling the actual static tag data, but instead only allows access to APDUs on top of the higher level protocol ISO 7816. Now the question is, can we modify Android HCE to fulfill NFC toolkit requirements for interacting with readers? The Android NFC stack is divided into the kernel and user space. In kernel space we have the NFC chipset and drivers. In the user space we have a hardware abstraction layer to support different chipset manufacturers and the so-called NCI. NCI is the NFC controller interface, which provides a standardized way to configure NFC chipsets by sending configuration streams to the chipset. All of the NCI compatible chipsets support setting static tag data. So the missing functionality of setting static tag data in Android HCE is not a hardware, but a software limitation. To solve this problem, we can use symbol hooking to send and modify configuration streams and modify software logic in the native and Java parts of the Android NFC service. NFCGate uses the exposed and add exposed hooking frameworks for Java function hooking and XHOOK for hooking native C, C++ functions. This lifts the software limitations of Android HCE. 
Mars et al. presented the NFC gate proof of concept in 2015. This proof of concept had full tech emulation support, including setting static tech data, and it circumvented the Android ISO 7816 AID routing limitation. As features, it supported the clone mode, which allowed to clone static tech data of a tech. This ignores active APDU exchanges, but is sufficient to perform an attack, like the cloning of electric vehicle charging station NFC tags. Another mode is the relay mode, which can be used to capture APDUs between a tag and the reader by using two smartphones and a server. One smartphone acts as a tag and is presented to the legitimate reader, while the other smartphone takes the role of a reader and communicates with the legitimate tag. Data relayed over the server is locked in the app's storage and can be displayed in the app. The cool thing about NFC Gate is that it just requires an ordinary smartphone, which is an inconspicuous and cheap way to do NFC analysis. The all new NFC Gate extended and improved the proof of concept by adding support for new Android versions, modern platform architectures and covering all available NCI chipsets. We further extended the support of NFC technologies and implemented new modes, for example, the replay and on-device capture mode. In addition, we advanced logging support with import and export of NFC traffic in the standardized PCAPMG format for use in the Wireshark protocol dissector. Now, the server has a Python plugin interface for easily implementing NFC protocols and modifying traffic on the fly. The highlighted features enabled us to conduct a case study on a smart door lock system. The system we investigated consists of a base station that can manage multiple locks and transponders. For example, one can present a transponder to one lock which opens, while another lock prevents access. The base station communicates with the locks over a proprietary wireless protocol, and every lock communicates with a transponder over NFC. The focus of our research is the NFC communication between a lock and a transponder. The lock is an expensive enterprise-level locking system made by a well-known European vendor. The transponders are MIFA Desfire EV1 tags with a randomized NFC identifier. The lock also expects the NFC identifiers to be random. This means we cannot use the popular PN532 chipset to emulate such tags due to missing support for randomized IDs. However, NFC gate does not have such limitations. So our first step in analyzing the protocol was to capture the communication between the lock and the transponder. We connected two smartphones in NFC gate relay mode, where one has a PIC role and the other has a PCD role to a server. Then we hold the devices in proximity to the door locking system we see that the lock and transponders exchange data. This means that the system does not protect against relay attacks. This let us collect multiple relay traces in PCAP and G trace files. After that, we used NFC gates replay mode to test the system against replay attacks. In replay mode, we select a previously recorded relay log of a successful unlocked attempt and hold the smartphone in tech role in proximity to the lock. The lock opens without requiring a legitimate tech. This caught our interest, so let's have a look at the NFC traffic. The traffic between lock and transponder is not compliant to ISO 7816. But as we already know, NFC gate solves this limitation of Android HCE. We see that the lock sends multiple commands of the identifier command set to the transponder. It begins with selecting an application and starting AES authentication. 
After the authentication has finished successfully, the log requests the tag UID in message number 7, to which the transponder responds with an encrypted tag UID. The Deathfire authentication protocol establishes an encrypted channel between a PIC and PCD and ensures that both have knowledge of the same key. It uses AES CBC and provides protection against replay attacks through the use of nonces. Now the question is, why does our replay attack work when the AES authentication protocol has replay protection? To analyze this, we opened multiple relay traces in Wireshark and compared their data. Here we see messages of two relay traces. We notice that message number 5, which is sent by the log to the transponder, has a number of bytes that are identical in every trace. Even though the use of AES-CBC should chain message number 4 into message 5. This implies an incorrect use of aes CBC. With additional analysis, we reverse engineer the whole protocol the log uses. Deviations from the original protocol are marked in red. We see that the nonce RA has a static value and message 5 is improperly generated by not updating the AIV. What's interesting is that the log must implement a fix to make the protocol work correctly. Otherwise, the channel key would be different for log and transponder, resulting in a wrong tag UID received on the log side. So the second issue is that the cryptographic protocol implementation is broken. The locking system does not protect against replay attacks. We also found more attacks on the locking system. There is a desktop software which allows an administrator to register transponders with the system from a computer. The software contains the AES authentication key K, which is static for the entire product series. This static key K enables two more attacks against the system. For example, in a walk-by attack, an attacker can read the tag UID from a tag without requiring an active relay to a lock and store the ID for later use. In addition, an attacker can escalate privileges or perform a brute force attack. The tag UID is not random but looks like a serial number. The UIDs of tags with the same manufacturing date have similar numerical values. In our case, roughly 3500. An attacker with knowledge of a tag UID could predict UIDs of other transponders registered in the system easily. Because the lock does not limit the number of unlocking tries per time period, it would take an attacker roughly 20 minutes with a throughput of 3 tries per second to escalate privileges from one transponder UID to the other. After we found these issues, we contacted the vendor with our findings and responsibly disclosed the security issues. Regarding the broken protocol implementation, the vendor's plan is to properly implement the protocol and roll out an update to the system. This is an easy fix. Fixing the use of a static key requires more effort, since the vendor plans to change the key, which would require users to redeploy every log and transponder in their installations. The vendor says they cannot fix the vulnerability against relay attacks due to hardware limitations. Preventing relay attacks is actually a hard problem in the current research topic. A naive idea of preventing relay attacks is to set an upper bound on communication latency. The ISO standard defines a so-called frame waiting time. It is a way to retransmit a frame if no response has been received for some time. The tag defines this interval. In our experiments, the FWT was never enforced by any reader. Despite the standard defining the FWT only as a safety measure, it has been proposed as a relay countermeasure previously. In order to determine a real upper bound on latency, we performed some latency measurements with NFC gate. We started NFC gate in different configurations. First, 
we have a baseline configuration where a reader communicates with tag directly. Then we have a local replay using NFC gate. And four relay configurations in different network settings. For example, we have a Bluetooth personal area network where the server is hosted on a smartphone. Second, we use Bluetooth tethering where the server is hosted on a computer in a wireless network. And last, we have wireless hotspot and access point configurations. Those differ in the server hosting. WH hosts the server on one smartphone and WA hosts the server on a different device in the wireless network. This means we have two wireless connections in the former and three connections in the latter case. This graph shows the total latency of the communication in the aforementioned configurations. A replay is almost indistinguishable from the baseline configuration, especially considering the minimum FWT that the tag reports. We see that we cannot place a general upper bound on the communication latency. However, use case specific bounds are possible, but they could be hindered by expensive crypto operations compensating network latency. Our results show that an upper bound on communication latency is no general solution. Summarizing these results, do not use the FWT as a countermeasure. Hard timings are only possible in deployments with full control over tags and readers. A general countermeasure against relay attacks are distance bounding protocols. Their implementation is possible on two layers. The protocol layer requires extension to the NFC standards and new hardware, whereas an implementation on the application layer could additionally ensure authenticity, but is application specific, so that every system must ship their own possibly incompatible distance bounding protocol. Concluding NFC gate, it's a smartphone based NFC toolkit supported by any Android smartphone with Expose or at Expose support. It does not require changes to the system image and has interoperability with standard tools like Wireshark. Our Python plugin system allows to develop and test attack scenarios easily. This helps finding real security issues in widely deployed products. If you want to get in touch with us, visit NFCgate on GitHub or send us an email. Thanks for your attention.